Okay, good morning. Um, I will uh, talk today about uh, our way to shrink code. And uh, the session is called Honey, I Shrunk the Code. Um, so uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, the improvements we have been making in our software and uh, an exciting framework that we are working on. My name uh, is Biat Brunner, and uh, I am on the Joomla sphere since about 12 years. Well, that was before Joomla, so um, you can call me a mambo dinosaur if you want. <laughs> um, I have been a top contributor of Joomla 1.0.15 with a lot of security fixes, and one of the um, rushing contributor for Joomla 3.2.0 for, and you can blame me for the App Store installed from web and some Jux uh, improvement in the user interface, for instance, for the new control panel that we have since 3.2. I'm also a member of the Joomla security strike team and from the Joomla bug squash team. My name is Biat on forums and otherwise I live in Switzerland. My uh, saying is that we should make things as simple as possible, but just not simpler than what's really needed. And I love our open source and working with the community. So uh, today I will be speaking about uh, Aha Wow mainly, which is our new framework for building uh, applications without writing code. Uh, but before that, as an introduction, I will be speaking about uh, software system architecture and design, uh, the need for abstraction, consistency, don't repeat yourself things, and why they are so important. So why do we want to open source? And we need to remember ourselves that uh, more and more in these days of uh, software as a service, open and free uh, cloud platforms, which make life so easy. And um, we need to remember ourselves and our, as the people we know, that uh, we are here for the open source and that um, that's freedom for times, at least. Um, it's freedom to run what we want, where we want, uh, how we want and for the purpose we want. It's a freedom to understand what's happening, work together to change things in a better way. Um, we want to be able to redistribute uh, the software to our neighbors for to help them and even to redistribute improved versions so that maybe the original uh, coder will be merging those changes and improving his software. So it's about collaboration, it's about all those things that we perfectly know but uh, that we need to remind ourselves from time to time because we take it for so granted that when we talk about those things to other people which are not in that circle, uh, they are taking us like a bit crazy idiots. And uh, interestingly, um, we are not crazy idiots because our way of doing things is actually what all those giants do before hiding their software behind the software as a service. So, but of course they don't t take care of that. All those systems are goal is to, is to to make the customer as captive as possible of their platform, and that's don't not what you want. And owning our data is something which is very important. There, um, we have seen the problem with software as a services with uh, Google Reader, Google Wave, and so on. And we are starting to see some other problems like the very nice Google Mail, Gmail, a great mail platform. We are sending out over 300,000 emails a week on our newsletter. 40% of the destination emails are run by Google Mail. 40% of the emails, emails worldwide. But 25% uh, or 30% are really at gmail.com, others are just run by Google Mail. But they are filtering those mails. <laughs> and that's a monopoly. And uh, even greater than that, uh, they are starting as a better new services, like when you get a bill by mail, instead of just putting the subject, they, will be they are putting now, you got an invoice from that for this, of this amount, and you need to pay it by that date. 
And to help you, uh, do you want to pay now with a Google Wallet? How great for the customer. But if they do that as a service for beta, that means they're already doing that for grabbing your data to uh, make your profile even better known. And all of these things uh, mean that we, as an open source developers, we need to be aware that all those things happen and they all happen to facilitate the, the, the life of the users. And what we want to do here is to facilitate the life of the developers of ourselves. So um, let's see about what a good, good architecture of software brings. A good architecture uh, brings beautiful code, beautiful applications. It brings functional applications, consistent ones, which are durable in the time. And at the end of the day, it brings happy uh, people, happy users, happy customers. And if you don't have a good architecture of software, you have exactly the reverse of that. You have messy code, uh, non-functional, uh, inconsistent code, code that needs to change and be refactored all, all the time, and at the end of the day, unhappy people. So software architecture design is really, really important, and that's something that in Joomla we need to further improve. The way we work is by proposing patches, propo proposing pull requests. They get the first um, first comments that they get is that we forgot a comma somewhere and we have a missing blank line somewhere. <laughs> and we are missing the whole big picture. And this is happening because of GitHub, the way it presents diffs. It presents the diffs lines here, you know. And you don't see the big picture. He, he changed few lines here, a few lines there, and a few lines here. You don't see the architecture which is behind that. And if you don't put that architectural change in the description, and the reviewers, if you don't jump to the code, but we first read the description and we think about the improvement, we are going to improve that. But GitHub is guilty there for showing the, the diffs the way they're showing them. So um, architecture is very important. Um, so basically, a, a good architecture uh, is translating about clean code, reusability of code in libraries for different purposes than the ones that they have been designed for, um, a consistent API, which is as generic as possible, uh, no copy-paste. Now, Joomla is probably one of the best examples of somebody who graduated from the copy and paste university with uh, mention. And uh, we need to change that to improve our code quality and not have nightmares like we had for ZJAX for 3.2 when we wanted to change and do add search tools everywhere. We had to add them for each view. We had to add them for each component. We had to add them. And they are still not added everywhere. So we need to change that. And we have a proposal here how to change them. Um, we also need to get more into aspect-oriented programming to have clear aspects for each class, e clear aspects for each uh, thing that we do one at a time. And finally, we need to uncouple parts. Th everything is very tightly coupled. We need to work with interfaces. We need to work uh, in a more modern way there. Well, is that easy? Uh, yes, of course it's easy. Um, we, we just uh, redo everything. But in practice, no, we need to look at our history. We can't rewrite everything all the time. We need backwards compatibility. We don't have the time to do that. Large changes and refactorings are needed, but they are very complicated to review. So we have zero chance to get that committed. <laughs> um, so it's not easy, but it's doable. One example that I would like to uh, put there is the observers and mappers pattern that I introduced for tags, actually as a bug fix for another bug fix proposal which was making gtable much more messier. And I saw that, I said, no, we, are not, we shouldn't be putting that messier, it's already messy. gtable is doing much too much things already, which is not just related with a table. So that's when I proposed another patch to fix the bug, which was introducing observers, so minimum changes to jtable, adding a pattern, actually two patterns, or even three, <laughs> uh, which were solving the problem correctly 
And not only did they solve the problem correctly, but they proved themselves to be useful to implement content history. So when content history was implemented, it used exactly the same pattern without changes. So that's, that's a proof that it's a pattern which uh, worked. Um, why do we need to abstract more things? Why do we need to be more consistent and uh, do things uh, in a less repetitive way? Well, abstraction is boring. Abstracting things needs to think one level up or two levels up or three levels up. And that needs a good understanding of modeling things. That's something that the brain needs to be used to. And it sometimes makes the code less understandable because it's not less concrete, it's more abstract. But on the other side, it, when we start modeling uh, a concrete thing which is complex, becomes a sum of small abstract things. So it's much easier. And then it can get reused. Uh, consistency of code is not easy. It requires understanding of what, what's existing, what the architecture is there. It needs to have examples to run on. And it's incredible to see how much people just take an example and change it a bit. Uh, they take your code as an example, so our code should be really good. Um, but it's a big win for the user uh, as an experience and also for new features. Uh, do not repeat yourself is more work as the first copy paste that you want to do. And now my, my own goal is when I write code and I copy something and want to paste it somewhere else, I have a, a red light ringing and I say, do I really need to do that? Can I just refactor that out and not do the copy paste? Or can I do that better with a pattern that is not there yet and just do the pattern? So it's a bit more work when you do it the first time, but then it's a big win afterwards. It brings maintainability, code reduction, and so on. So less code, simpler code, least, uh, easier to, to maintain is something that we really need to aim at with a new PHP 5.3 language improvements and 5.4 which are coming. Uh, we should have some much better tools to do things easier. Okay, uh, software engineering itself has been evolving um, quite drastically since it has been um, started. From the pioneering era, we went to into a permanent software crisis. <laughs> and every 10 years, we have a major crisis. And actually, I would say it's a constant crisis. It's a constant crisis. Uh, we have a crisis because projects usually run out of budget, uh, out of schedule. Um, our productivity is not uh, there where we want it to be. We have quality issues that we need to address, security issues, um, security in terms of code, security in terms of uh, users. And we are often reaching limits of current paradigms. We often um, need to invent new paradigms, improve things, and uh, it's a constant fight, actually, that we have. And um, we are often reaching the limits of current things like, for instance, MVC, we have reached the limit in Joomla probably that we need to, to improve now, HHMVC and, uh, and other uh, software patterns. And the interesting thing is that since the 80s, everybody was trying to find a silver bullet to, f to make software engineering like mechanical engineering, like, like electronics engineering a science and, and not also an art. <laughs> but uh, obviously there has been no success and probably there's no single silver bullet. There are maybe several ones that we need to use. And that has been um, reflecting software maintenance cost, cost. In the 80s, software maintenance cost was double of the development cost. In the 90s, it went 30% higher. And now it's probably even higher. And when you see a different software architecture, the maintenance cost, cost of, for instance, a WordPress, which is not that object-oriented compared to a Joomla is probably much higher in wet WordPress and in Joomla because of our object-oriented um, approach. Now, in 1995, there was a survey about um, larger software projects. And 50% of their, them were either, um, uh, were not considered as being uh, successful. And 
um, average project overshoot in budget and time is 50%. And 75% of large software writings have either never been used or do not sp need spec of users. Even worse, the higher the budget goes of your software projects, the most likely your project will be a failure. And if you reach a $10 million project scope, you have a 100% chance that it will be running late or be over budget or be unproductively done, be unusable by the users, have quality, big quality issues or security issues, sometimes even deadly ones if it's a, a large project. And that's even if it succeeds one day. So the larger the project, the, the higher the risk of failure. And that has to do with software engineering and software architectures. It has to do with that step that a few people need to take before you scale up. And if a project goes wrong, usually you hire more people. And that's exactly making the situation worse. When a project goes wrong, you shouldn't be hiring more people, but you should be uh, taking a clear look what everyone is doing and, and, and rethink where you made the mistakes up front, if you still have the time to do that and redo things. So we have a big issue in software engineering and we wanted to address that um, as uh, many other tried before us. So uh, to change that, you, you can apply different methods, have structured programming, object-oriented programming, do unit tests, output tests, use better tools, IDs, uh, and testing tools, have more discipline, more professionalism in what you do, apply formal methods and, and processes, and, and, and basically put so much layers of things around that you kill the creativity. You kill the simple doing, because everything is so complicated, uh, and that didn't work either. So there's no silver bullet found yet. And there is no single solution to that crisis. There are multiple solutions. Our current trends to try to help there is aspect-oriented programming, entity relation, processor paradigm, uh, implementing hierarchical MVC, to have model-driven designs with model transformation, code generation, dependency injection containers, to uh, decouple things, uh, do agile programming and uh, release often. Um, some of the larger projects, um, like for instance uh, Flickr, Facebook, they have several releases a day, actually a dozen or two dozen releases. Uh, each commit into, into master goes into production and they have a quick rollback as well. So you have a very short reaction si uh, time to introducing new feature and removing bugs. So um, those are things which are made to try to circumvent the issues that you have with the software architecture <laughs> to, to start with. So um, that's, that's not easy. Extreme programming, lightweight coding is uh, something which is very trendy. Using formal method is very boring, but uh, still very trendy in uh, university circles and code generators uh, are, and domain specific languages are something very fun. The next trend for my own forecast is that we are going to use more formal description languages. We are going to go more specifications driven, uh, interpreters, code generators from specifications directly to go over code using uh, an implementation hassles. We are going to uh, leverage more the dependency injection containers. We are going to have more automation there to make dependencies uh, resolve better and uh, in a more safe way. Lightweight co coding uh, is a very important trend that I'm seeing coming. And using domain-specific languages. That's languages we are just made for a particular purpose. And then you make a compiler which makes it in a general language. That's, that's something that's, that's coming really strong in university research. And in web user experience, more natural interactions, simpler interactions, while being more powerful, a lot of drag and drop will be coming more and more, and workflow-oriented user interfaces with um, mobile-first. Uh, how, how, how many times 
uh, do we prefer to use on my mobile phone uh, an application or website instead of the screen? Because it's focused on what I want to do and it has a workflow there. And on the big screen, great, a lot of estate, but a lot of side information that I don't need. So I think that this is something which is coming in the user. Um, so, well, um, why methodology and specification before implementation? Well, it's like building a house without having any drawings for it. <laughs> it is like um, asking yourself, well, uh, there's no drawing for that house. Will it even hold there? Will the workers be happy in there to first build something, then submit the design for a review process, and then have to scratch everything? <laughs> workers won't be happy. They will, you will be having strikes. Why don't we have a strike in Joomla? A lot of people submit something, and then that when you fi finally submit it, then uh, application gets asked on the architecture that you had at the beginning. <laughs> but there's no review before that. And for big projects, big tasks, we need to change that process. I told that last year, something's changed. I'm telling that again, we are not yet there. We need to have a review and approval process for architecture and design stages and approvals at that stage so that we can check that the implementation corresponds to that and then people who are implementing, they have a good chance that the code gets accepted if it meets the designs, architecture, specs, and the coding rules. So that's something important. Um, well, then um, we need careful planning, yes, that's sure. Okay, enough is problems, uh, but are there solutions? Well, uh, first of all, there's no si silver bullet. But we know that we can do much, 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 much more better. Now how? Well, it's easy. We just specify uh, functionality. We review the specification. Then we do a design of the software, review design to respect specs. We implement according to the design. Then we verify that the implementation respects design. But does that implementation respect the specification? You don't know at that stage. So that's not easy, and it doesn't guarantee that uh, the specification is really implemented. And that's how software design traditionally works. You specify, then you go to design, and then you implement, for instance, in MVC or other uh, frameworks like Joomla. And the thing here is that the implementation and the specification, they are not related. So um, we have been working on that and I have been doing that as a personal, personal research project now for over five years to try to find a way to uh, make things different and easier for us. And um, actually uh, the solution was to tie directly the specification to the result without going to the design phase, without going to the implementation phase. And uh, that allows specification and implementation to be completely related and uh, many other benefits. Now that seems a bit strange because uh, there is uh, no PHP code, there is no uh, JavaScript, there is no SQL queries, and uh, that seems a bit magic. And uh, I'm sure that some of you say in the room, um, they say, aha, and then soon they say, wow. Well, so we had to find something to for those acronyms. Um, so um, how does that compare to what we do now? Right now we are using classical model view controller implementation, sometimes hierarchical. We use helpers, we use JavaScript helpers. It's not necessarily hierarchical. It's definitely not language agnostic because it's implemented in PHP, so you cannot port that to uh, Node.js, for instance. There is a lot of copy-paste code, a lot of layouting has to be done specifically, and it's not formal. Now, we compare that with uh, wow MVC, where we have only specification. It is completely hierarchical. It's completely language agnostic because it's, there is no implementation. It's uh, do, n do not repeat yourself. There is no specific code. Well, you can have specific code if you really wish to, but there's no need. But more importantly, it's formal. 
which means that it's variable. You can check that the implementation corresponds to the specification and uh, they correspond by design. So how do we do that? So let's take two minutes to run through an example, which is a currency rates browser, a table which displays currencies. Okay, first we need a model. A model here uh, is a table which has an uh, implementation class related, which has columns, which have a name, a type, and a label. And with that model, we generate automatically the database table, we install it automatically, and if it has not exactly the right scheme, we adapt that scheme. So in the next release, we add a column, we just add the column there. There is no upgrade queries to be added. It will be automatically checking the should be state with the is state and generate automatically the queries to go from the is state to the should be state, which is nice because you can upgrade, but you can also downgrade, which is nice because you don't have to write the queries for each database. This is database agonistic. But that's an abstraction layer. It's an abstraction layer, yes. It's, it's just the wind about software architecture abstracting things. But we are just abstracting it quite high. We could abstract one more layer, and we will be abstracting one more layer, of course. We have some ideas to even abstract one more. So the, the, the real case is you, you can then maybe use the same database as the system, so you can maybe open to Oracle. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Now, now, this now works on MySQL, but if we, have, if we want to support Oracle, for instance, we just have to change the implementation here. And the implementation, it's, it's, level it's low level. And you change it down there and you, you have the benefit up there. So uh, it's, it's very interesting to see, you, you put some, you, you throw some table and you put some, some other table and you see which queries it generates to go from one to the next one. Um, and then you see that, for instance, uh, well, the initial value is not there. So we have added, for instance, initial value when you upgrade can have a attribute, initial value, and there you can put either formula or you can put a number or a calculation or even a query. And um, that allows to do upgrades very uh, cleanly. The controller, well, that's something which links a model with a view, right? And uh, so we have an action here. We name that show currencies. Uh, that is routed with a request view being equal to show cur. And we invoke a view which is called show currencies in mode show, not the mode edit, but just show, using the data currencies which comes from the table currencies. And then we need a view. Now the view here, okay, it's for the admin interface. Well, it's called currencies. Um, it has also a name here which is related with the controller calling before. In the controller we were uh, calling the view show currencies, which we find here. And now in that view we have a table browser, which is a, a more complex object, which implements a nice Joomla table browser, uh, which again has a name so we can refer to it, a label to display. It has a list of fields which is comprised of uh, rows uh, which have fields inside and each field is a column in the, in the table. So we have a row number here, an ID which is a primary checkbox here, the currency as a string, as a base currency, again a string, the rate which is a float, the exchange rate, and then at the end we have an ID. And here we specify the width of the columns, the alignments, labels, and uh, that gives us direct that currency exchange browsers with the uh, checkboxes here, the currency, base currency, exchange rate, and ID. And the old things that you have on a Joomla table. No code, no PHP code, no JavaScript code, no CSS, everything is done just in XML, 
as a specification. Now, if you want to display that table in Drupal, we want to display that table in WordPress, we want to uh, display that table with node.js, we just write either the compiler or the interpreter for that language. And that allows us to have those tables perfectly nicely presented in Joomla 3, in Joomla 2.5, even in Joomla 1.5, 1.0. It, it was working, now it's not working anymore. We removed those support of Mambo. <laughs> even in Mambo it was working, actually. <laughs> we, it was, we, we did it for the fun, you know, and uh, now we just removed it because we did, didn't want to have those special cases anymore. But we, we might port it to other, to other frameworks as well uh, quite easily. Uh, but the nice thing here is that uh, we are using it in CBSubs GPL already since uh, uh, over three, two, uh, two years now. Um, so we had quite some improvements there. We are, we are using in CB 2.0 for the whole administration interface now. And we added more, Im more improvements there. Now, another side effect of that is that um, we know exactly precisely that in CB subs, uh, we have zero lines of specific code. But we have 6,900 lines of specifications. 6,900 lines of XML with attributes on the same line than the tag. But those 6,900 lines, we can now count easily with just doing grabs and and word count in, 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 uh, in the terminal, we can count that we have 41 controllers, 50 views, 56 models, 397 data bus queries. I'm not saying SQL queries, that data bus queries. And we have, we are controlling 650 settings in that, different settings in that back, back end. Uh, and I'm not counting those which are the same for a different type of plan, which are the same for different gateways. It's just that way. And now Community Builder 2.0 has 2,200 lines of uh, specifications for the backend. I, I didn't count the controllers, but it's probably a, a third of all of that. So uh, it is used in practice. And well, w a few more things here. <laughs> it's not it's not just doing the view and doing the control and doing the, the model. Uh, it has a database agonistic query compiler and schema compiler. So we can specify, I'll be going through details uh, now if we still have time. Uh, and we have time. Um, the database queries are not SQL queries. They are, rip they are specified in formal language XML. Um, we have formal data set query specification. We have inter inheritance and extension possibilities. We handle permissions and view access levels of Joomla. And the, this interface allows to handle 100% of the admin interface. So you can have any component, any, we, we, we could model any Joomla component with that. Um, it handles toolbars, menus, the online help, all field types, table, even graphs and widgets. And it's event driven. And it's also event capable of event triggering. So you can trigger other events either in XML or in PHP if you need to. Now, how does that work? Database, I have here a, a, a real table of Community Builder 2.0, the tabs table here, um, which and this description uh, handles the creation, handles checkings of the table if, if, uh, if it's correctly, the schema is correct in table, upgrades and downgrades automatically. Now here, that's, that's a real case here. Uh, so we have a table name here. Um, the class is assigned automatically, so there's no class here. Uh, it's not a strict table. We are never dropping it in case of an install. Then we have columns here, types, we have uh, outer increments, nulls, and so on. We have indexes here. It even uh, creates the indexes. If the index is changing, it drops the old index and it recreates a new one. So uh, all of that is done automatically. We have a queries compiler. Here is a, a, an example query for a filter. We have a filter by tab ID. And uh, 
that is the query, SQL query, described in a Hawao. Um, okay, we have a filter for tab ID. There's a value that we need to look for is tab ID. The value type is an SQL string here, and the type of that filter is data, which means that there is a data below it, and the data here uh, is of type SQL multiple rows, which means a database query. It runs on the table com profiler tab based on the key, main key ID. It has rows, which have two columns, tab ID and title. Tab ID we want it as value, and title we want it as text, because we want to use the drop-down selectors of, of Joomla. Okay. We have ordering, by position and ordering, ascending. And we have a where, in this case, which is uh, the fields needs to have value one, and that's a type. This fields is a SQL field, and the value is a constant int. So we want to display here in that filter all tabs which have fields equal one on them. And that generates a SQL query for that. And uh, the result here is that in the search tool, well, I didn't drop it down, but uh, we have a search tool which displays that uh, SQL query. Now the interesting thing is it not only generates SQL queries automatically, but it allow allows you to do mix ins. You can compile that query and um, extend it with another query, a qu partial query. You can add where's dynamically. You can uh, uh, add groups dynamically. You can add fields dynamically. So we can compile a basic query and extend it with plugins. And that's very powerful. And it automatically compiles the SQL query. And you get you at the end, you get a huge query, which is automatically compare, compiled. It's really, really, really powerful. We have we have join here as a uh, as a uh, as a uh, as a thing. We have well triggers and procedures we didn't implement yet, because we we want to be as data as agonistic as possible. And procedures and triggers are quite tricky for that. But um, we we implement joins, left joins, right joins, inner joins. We you can do sub queries. You if you want to do a sub query here in the rows in the field, you just put field type data and you put another query. It's as easy as that. You need to think the other way around. Instead of starting with select, yeah. you start the other way around. Which data I want and how I'm going to get it. So basically, when you write that way, you write exactly the other way you would write an SQL query. And that results in, in, in those search tools. Now for the table browser, we have implemented search tools here at just one place and it was automatically available in all our table browsers. We didn't have to go each view like we did for Joomla 3.2. And then we implemented batch tools the same way here because this was implemented generically. We can add tools by groups as we want. So that's, that's really, really, really powerful. Another example is that the presentation in the table browser object uh, allows to present hierarchies it allows to have uh, clickable toggles, radios, links, CSS classes. You can format text. You can, uh, it handles permissions and dynamic attributes as well, and you can have sub-queries there as well, or call other models. Uh, another very, very um, powerful thing is that we can extend on the fly the XML specification. We, we can have extend, and here we're using XPath to say specify to which node we want to expand. Here we want to expand the types. So we extend two path node CBXML types from path node, any node which has types type, and from a given model. And that will be automatically adding to the XML tree the types from that plugin. Or we c this is a, more, uh, a one where we want to add all payment processors, which are in plugins, integration plugins to CV subs. 
So we want to go to the path node calling sibling params field set. And we add in that field set, we just add from the views name radio settings from the files admin lead processors and in mode prepend. And here, we just want to add a view from a gateway. Then we again do it this way. And we can even in files, we can have stars for getting from plugins. So here we, we can extend. And same way we can, oh sorry, the last one was in, opla, extend. Um, again, that's inherit, not extend. And now in a view, for instance, if we want, don't want to repeat ourselves, we have gateways in CV subs. They all have a name, a description, uh, currencies, things like that. So we have made a generic view for that. And instead of repeating that for each gateway, we just say inherit name, blah, 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 blah. And then below that inherit, it's like you would have, would have the parent view. And there you can either add things or replace things. So you just write the differences and you can have multiple level of interest. And the parser itself, when it goes to parse that specification, he has all that levels. He knows where it is in which one. And then it generates a view correctly. So again, don't repeat yourself here. And that allows us to extend uh, things very easily. For instance, in, a, uh, in Community Builder, in a field edit, the CB privacy plugin can add its own specific parameters to the parameters of the field. The field type can add its own specific parameters here. Uh, in CB subs, in each plan, we can have integrations, and each integration plugin can add its own tab here. No PHP code, just XML. And as a matter of fact, um, with the extend statement, we can have a plugin which extends the core table by a column of its own, or we can extend a table by column in the model, or we can extend controllers, or types, or models. So without having a, a PHP coding, we have a formal way to extend things. And formal means a lot of things. <laughs> the learning curve is probably, right now, it is like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're working on it. Uh, actually, we will be converting all our 100 plugins, admin area, to use that. So we'll have 100 examples. And by doing that, we are also writing documentation to, to help understand. But it's a completely new way of thinking, and it is sure has a steep first step. And we want to put that first step very low, but it's sure a new way of designing software. I haven't seen that kind of things in the software industry for real products. I have seen this kind of approaches for university projects, but not for real software yet, in the whole software industry. So uh, we are doing something quite cutting edge here, I believe. I hope so, at least. So another example here is uh, extending Joomla and menus. Now in CB2.0, we have a lot of more types, and we have the plugin type here. And the plugin type can add, can add parameters dynamically. Right now, it's adding them not using our Hawao XML, because there is a bug that we need to do a pull request for. But um, when that bug is fixed in Joomla, you are able to put a Hawao stuff inside the Joomla menu. Permissions. We can handle configuring permissions, like permissions field, all the permissions here, enforcing them, each action from the controller can have its permission. Core manage on com users here, for instance. And all actions of a given controller or subcontroller have permissions too. Table browsers have permissions, each field has permissions. And you just add that uh, permission and permission asset to, a, to an element in XML, and permissions are enforced automatically. Which means when I review the XML of CB2.0, I see those permissions, I can say, yes, that's how I want permissions to work. I can put a stamp on it, a formal stamp. And it 
I don't have to review code. Toolbar menus for the toolbars, for the buttons, we have apply, save, cancel, help here, and it will be automatically generating those, those buttons up there. Um, menu buttons, we have menu groups where you can have, uh, here you see, for instance, menu, that's interesting. Uh, there is a menu here, action, which has an action. This action has to, has to do with the CB, with the controller itself. And um, it will be automatically generating the link to go there. And the routing. So the routing is included there. Now, this menu button can have a field, which, uh, let me just show how it shows here. For instance, here I have, for instance, pavement gateway or pub plans, two published plans, okay? This comes from the database and that comes from a query. And that query from, comes from here. That has fields, mail counts, and it has data, mailer count, SQL count from that table with that key, that value, and value type. And you can have, for each one, you can have their queries inside. And that generates automatic that, that nice design here. Bar graphs also, we have a field type bar graph and plot as well with a with lot of plot using uh, a plotting library. And that gives those bar graphs here or those uh, plots there in the CB subs for the panel. So a nice way to display things. And finally, we have event generation. We can fire triggers for CB or Joomla and that uh, means that we can fire on a given group, a given event, and we can handle the results which come back. And those results can be either HTML that we display inside the view, or it can extend the XML specifications. The event can return an XML specification for the view. And it extends and we can say where we want to extend the result there. For instance, we have uh, here uh, for invoices here, we can extend some fields in the field set depending on the gateway. So we are triggering here all CBSUPS plugins for event on XML before CBSUPS displays or saves an invoice. And we extend dynamically the field set depending on the gateway that we have without coding. <laughs> and the mode here is, sorry, is replace or append, which means that it can replace some fields. For instance, if you have want to, to treat the country in a, dif in a different way, you can replace the country field for the invoice. And that's done on the key attribute of name. Okay, community builder 2.0 is using Ahawao now for the whole backend almost a whole backend, we have two more views to convert. Um, but almost a whole backend, we have been uh, replacing like 50,000 lines of code by 2,000 lines of specification. CB subs, GPL, which is used by some uh, Joomla user groups and uh, country uh, Joomla organizations for leveraging their membership fees is using it. We have implemented in CB 2.0 inside a framework. Okay, uh, two minutes? Okay. Thanks. Um, we have done FCB framework, which is a Joomla library. Inside that, we have a very generic micro framework here and a CB related framework. We are using Composer and plugins, CB plugins can add their libraries here as well. And Ahawao is in cblib slash backslash cblib backslash Ahawao there, if you want to take a look at it. Okay, so uh, basically we have a modern software architecture. I'm not going to go into details there. We are using namespace, namespace packages, which are independently made. Ahawao is one of them. And I will just jump to the conclusion. Using a formal approach has a lot of benefits. Uh, it allows to have a beautiful result, which is completely functional, completely consistent, completely durable, 
and additionally, it is verifiable. So you can verify that your implementation is uh, corresponding to your specification, and you can audit it. And as we using XML, you can use uh, XSD and other things to ma make sure that the language itself is correct. But don't these four words ring a bell? Remember that slide about good software architecture? We are going to the right direction, I think. So thank you for listening. And uh, we are looking forward to see all the units that will be made on that interesting new technology. For, for, for the admin backend, it's perfectly fine. For the, it's very quick actually. And for the front end, it's also quite very okay because it's not, m not a lot of libraries actually. The library itself is very, very condensed. And if you have small XML files for specific tasks, built-in XML parser PHP is very fast. And Joomla itself does it too, I mean, for, for their J forms. Of course, we, we, are, we are working on cache systems. We are working on pa page caches, on, on, on display caches. And we are thinking of using, uh, of building a compiler in the future which generates PHP code directly, for instance. But that is possibly with a formal specification. We can start with interpreter and then we can do a compiler. That's usually how things are done. And then we write the compiler in that language, of course. <laughs>